All right, we are live. Audio and video is up. Welcome back. I uh, hope everybody had uh, a wonderful break, a relaxing break, uh, and that you're, uh, you know, settling into the last week of the semester. Um, I know this doesn't really affect this class very much, but since we've come back from Thanksgiving break, all of your classes should be virtual now. So um, uh, I thought that it would probably be a good idea to have a few minutes to talk about remaining housekeeping for the course because we only have two substantive lectures left and then our exam review on Friday. Uh, so we're, we're pretty much down to the wire. This is it. So I thought I would just sort of, you know, do my best to put a bow on the course so that everybody knows where, where we're at and where we're headed. Uh, Cause you know, we haven't met in a week and, and, and all that. Okay. Um, first thing I'll mention, so let's talk about grade components. So attendance is up to date. Uh, the homework's graded, obviously, up until homework 8.3, which was due today. Uh, you're going to get homework 9.1 assigned today. And I'm going to talk about the remaining homework uh, schedule for the semester so that you're aware of what's going on. Um, I don't know if anybody saw on Teams. Uh, did anybody have a chance to download the spreadsheet? I'm just curious in chat if anybody saw that. Okay, for those of you that have not uh, downloaded that yet, this the name of that came from an old buddy of mine in grad school. He would call this the at-home game. And what he would do is he would take the syllabus, which he would take the, the grade breakdown, and then he would sort of back calculate what he would need to get on the final in order to get a certain grade. And, and he called that playing the at-home game. And so what I did is I developed a spreadsheet to where you could input your grades uh, uh, up until today, and you could sort of say, okay, if I want to get an A on the final, I need this. If I want to get a B on the final, I need this. And uh, so I, I posted that to teams, and so you all can mess around with that if you'd like. I will mention, I do go, I do round grades at the end of the semester. So if you have an 89.6, I round that to a 90. So I always round to the nearest grade point so that, it, so that everybody's aware of that. And the, the spreadsheet does that as well. So uh, uh, that's just for you all to tinker around with if you're interested in, uh, in checking out where you're at and, and where you're headed. You should test that against what Blackboard is currently reporting as your grade, which I did you know, for just about everybody and it, and it worked you know, uh, pretty well. So if there's any questions or whatnot, you let me know. Okay, um, let's talk about remaining housekeeping for the class. Okay, so you know, I, I, my way of, of conveying, you know, the, the class from here on out is to look at the grades, right? So exam one is done, exam two is done. We only have the final exam, we have our remaining homework assignments, and then obviously attendance, and, that, and that's the class. So let's talk about the homeworks. So I have two more homework assignments coming up. I have the homework that's assigned today, that's due Wednesday, uh, and then the homework that's assigned Wednesday, that's due Friday. Now, our, we drew, I don't know how you draw it, the long straw or the short straw, however you feel about it, but our exam's Monday. Um, so uh, as a result, I can't really accept late homework on that very last assignment because it's due Friday and then the exam's Monday. So what I'm going to do is for the second homework assignment, which is going to be on tributary area, uh, that's going to be due Friday. And then the solution is immediately going to populate, populate on Blackboard on Friday at 10 a.m. So I can't accept late homework on that last assignment because the solution is going to be uh, uploaded right after. But you'll see these two assignments this week are really easy. They're not matrix math. I'll, I'll tell you that. We're done with matrices. So no more, no more, no more matrix math for the rest of the semester. That's not saying it's not on the final, but uh, no more, no more matrix math in class. Um, I do have two bonus assignments for you. And so uh, let me explain the way the bonus assignments will work. So the first one is for your course evals. So uh, you all should have gotten the notice that the course evaluation survey that's administered by the university is open. Um, so if you do the survey, and you can say I'm the worst professor ever, uh, and that, that I'm a, a horrible teacher, and the class was horrible and everything. But if you do the survey, I, I'd appreciate if you didn't. Huh? Uh, but <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I really do want your honest feedback. This is a, the first time I've ever taught structural analysis online. And so it's been a, a trip for me, as I'm sure it has been for you. And so if there's any feedback that you have for me that you want me to, to know, like I really do want to hear it. Um, so if you do the survey, uh, the course evaluation survey, and you upload a little screen capture, a little clipping that shows that you've completed it, I will give you 10 bonus points on your homework, uh, on your homework grade. And so 
you know, you know each assignment's been worth 10 points. So let's say we've had, I don't know, 30 homework assignments throughout the semester. So let's say there's 300 total points. I would add your 10 points to that total, you know, earned points that you've had throughout the semester. So I guess there's a question, could you have a homework average greater than 100% if you've done, you know, beautifully on all the homeworks? Yes, that's possible. I'm not going to cap your homework average at 100%. So you, it can go over than that. So the first bonus homework assignment is on the course, the course eval, the university administered course eval. The second one is on the CLO survey. And so you all, I know you've done these before, you know, I don't know, some professors do them at the end of the semester, some professors do them during the final exam. Uh, I didn't want you to be disrupted during the final. So I just created a separate like Google Forms survey uh, that you all can uh, complete. And it actually, it'll open up here in a few minutes. I, I, I purposefully kept it closed until now because I did want to mention something. And it's about the majors. So um, as you know, we created the new BSC or the BSCE program. So some of you are still BSC students and some of you have opted for the new program. Uh, there's a checkbox at the very top of the survey. Again, it's anonymous. I don't know who did what, but we do need to be able to parse out who are the BSC students and who are the BSC students. So make sure that you indicate um, which one you are uh, and, and that, that's on the top. And if you upload a screen clipping that you've done that survey, I'll give you another 10 bonus uh, points on top of your homework average. And those are both due Friday, okay? So if you do those between now and Friday, that's a total of 20 possible uh, bonus homework points on top of your average. Uh, normally I, I do this, I only do like 10 points, but I've done so much more homework this semester that I thought, you know, I should, I should uh, uh, make it worth uh, a little bit worth your while. It's not going to, you know, uh, uh, be the difference between an A and a D in the class, but uh, I do appreciate your response and your time on that. All right. Any questions on the remaining homework assignments before I move on to the schedule? All right, I'm gonna take that as a note. Okay, so let's talk about um, just the remaining lecture schedule. So what I wanted to do this week is, you know, th this, this last portion of the course, we've been talking about matrix analysis. And my overall goal is for you to have a glimpse and understanding into how software programs work. But at the same token, I'm not expecting you to write your own research. I'm not expecting you to break out MATLAB or Python and write your own structural analysis program. That's not the point. The point is just for you to kind of get an understanding of the guts of one of these programs so that if you're building a model and you're designing a structure on your own and you get some error from RESA or STAT or whatever program it is, that you kind of have an understanding of what that error is and you understand what the program is doing. And by and large, I think we've, we've handled that. I don't think, you know, I need to spend this week going into beam elements and frame elements because I, I really don't think it's going to increase your skill set as structural engineers. What I want to do is increase your skill set as structural engineers. So I want to bring it back to, you know, as many practical topics as, as we can. And so the two topics I have this week are real practical you know, real life, everyday stuff that structural engineers do. And so that's that's kind of what I wanted to focus this, this final week of the semester on. So today we're going to uh, talk about aids for structural analysis. And that, that may not be the best name of the topic, but you'll understand what I mean by that uh, as we get into the lecture. On Wednesday, we're going to talk about this concept called tributary area. Tributary area is basically how do I take a building and turn it into a beam with a simply support with simple supports and a distributed load on it. Like how do I take these analytical model tools and apply them in real life? That's kind of what uh, this last lecture is about. Um, but lecture 39 is going to be about aids, and, and we'll talk about that here in a bit. As for the exam, I will go ahead and mention that we're going to have an exam review on Friday, and we'll discuss all the specific logistics. But the the Kicker, the, the big point I want to get across is that exam three is no different than the other two exams. It's, gonna, it's designed to be 50 minutes long. It's not designed to be a two hour long exam. Uh, it's uh, it's going to cover matrix analysis, what we're covering this week, and some of the conceptual stuff on RISA 2D. I'm not going to make you run RISA on the exam, but I'm going to ask you some conceptual questions uh, about it. So, um, again, it, there's, you know, it, 
it's, it's going to be designed to be a 50 minute long exam just like the others and you're good but you're still going to have two hours to do it because the university gave us that two hour uh, time chunk so i've given similar exams past few years i have never had uh issues with with time crunches on, on the final in this class and i don't see there being an issue uh, uh in this class in this course no the exam is not cumulative it is in statics but <laughs> but not in here um no it, it's not it's not cumulative Any other quick questions before we get into it? I have I have went ahead and posted the notes for this week on Blackboard. Everything's up, um, so if you want to look ahead into the future, you can. Um, but uh, but with that, I'm just going to get right into it, and I want to talk about. Uh, this this um, topic, this aids for structural analysis, um, and to to sort of um, introduce this topic and to set the stage, I want to show you something. All right, I, I went back through the lecture notes in this class and I looked at some of the problems that we've done. These two beams are problems that we've actually done in this class. These were problems that we've analyzed. We either were computing support reactions or drawing shear and moment diagrams or, or something of that nature. And like, let me just put on my real world hat a bit, okay? Um, these problems served a purpose. Um, each one of these problems contain components that you as a structural engineer really do need to understand, okay? You do need to understand how to handle triangular loads, right? I can think of at least three instances in real life where triangular loads occur. We have snow drifts, we have hydrostatic loads on dams or, or embankments or something like that, uh, and then we have beams supporting two-way slabs. Uh, those beams see triangular distributed loads. Uh, those are, those are real-world uh, applications of triangular loads. Um, you do need to be able to handle concentrated moments. You know, if you have a member, uh, like a cantilever beam framing into a structure, it's going to distribute a concentrated moment on the structure. Uh, if you, uh, you do need to be able to handle internal hinges for drawing influence lines and things of that nature. Every one of these problems contains components that you do need to be able to handle. But if I'm being honest with you, we're not building these. That's, that's, th these are educational examples. Okay, they've tested our abilities, expanded our, our uh, abilities to handle complex problems, but they're unrepresentative of real world problems. All right, and I, I got to be honest, like that, you'll, nobody's building these beams. Okay, and so I don't want you to look at this and go, well, this is the type of beam that we build in real world. We don't, we don't build these. We build, you know, we try and keep our problems as simple as possible. Um, to give you an example, this is a beam that we were, we would really deal with regularly. This is a routine analysis problem. This is a cantilevered beam with a uniformly distributed load, right? Cantilevered beams, we deal with cantilevered beams all the time. And one load that all beams must be able to withstand are their own self-weight. And self-weight, more often than not, is modeled as a uniformly distributed load. So cantilevered beams with a uniformly distributed load, those are bread and butter, everyday structural analyses that, that, that engineers deal with all the time. Okay, This is a problem, uh, and there are similar types of problems where you as a structural engineer might analyze these every day. Um, and the point I want to make is I want to look at these two beams on the slide. I got two different beams and really what's different about them? Like, let's be honest. What's really different about them? I have a, a beam that's 25 foot long that has three kips per foot on it. And I have a beam that's 37 foot long and it's got 1.9 kips per foot. But here's the thing. They really aren't that different. The only differences are the numerical inputs. If I look at these two beams, there's really only two parameters that define these numerical or the, these these structures, the load and the length, right? And that's it. In fact, I, I'd argue there's really only four parameters that fully define the problem, and that's the load, the span length, and then if you're determining deflections, you need E and I, right? And with those four numbers, you can solve everything, right? So instead of trying to analyze these problems uniquely, every single time, maybe what we ought to do is look at deriving some formulas that would be general purpose 
any time we have a cantilever beam with a uniformly distributed load. And so the question is, do we need to do that every time, or are there aids and tools out there that can assist us? The answer is yes, okay? There are oodles of analysis aids out there that we as structural engineers can use for routine computations, okay? And I wanna show you one. So, uh, and I'm gonna pull this up here in a little bit, but this is an example analysis aid. Uh, there's oodles of these out there. This is uh, AWC Design Aid 6. AWC stands for the American Wood Council. The American Wood Council who publishes the specs related to uh, timber design. Uh, and they have a design aid, design aid six, which lists shears, moments, and deflections for a variety of, of situations. And this is the one that we're looking at. And let me stop the share real quick because I want to actually just pull one of these up to sort of, excuse me, to sort of uh, explain what's going on here. So let me stop the share. All right, let me share screen. Okay, so I got my Firefox. Let's do AWC shear and moment diagrams. This is, you know, I'm just Googling. This is the first thing that pops up. Uh, and here you go, design age six. And so this is, a, you, know, you could download this today if you wanted. This is beam design formulas uh, with shear and moment diagrams. Uh, and again, this is from the uh, timber design spec. Uh, and, and what you'll find, this document is about 20 pages long, and it has oodles and oodles of different uh, aids for various uh, uh, situations. So for instance, we have simply supported beams. Okay, what if you have a uniformly distributed load? What if you have a concentrated load at the center? What if you have a concentrated load at any point? What if you have two loads that are symmetrically placed? Like, let me go to the first one and sort of show you what's going on here. So here's the first one. Let me zoom in a little bit. Okay, and, and if you take a look at this, just, just sort of digest what's going on here, okay? So for instance, we have a beam, it's a uniformly distributed load, I've got the shear diagram plotted, I've got the moment diagram plotted. I know what the support reactions are, I know what the shears are as a function of X, I know what the moments are as a function of X, um, I know what the maximum bending moment is, which you can see from the moment diagram is at mid-span, it's at the center. I know what the maximum deflection is at the center, um, I know what the deflection at any point is, the deflection at X. I can determine pretty much any of that with these plug and chug formulas. So the question becomes like, if you have a really routine analysis case, a really simple problem, I mean, you could use a lot of the tools that we've developed in this class. You could even break out reset. But even then, maybe that's a bit overkill for a problem that's so bread and butter, for a problem that's so routine that you're gonna do over and over and over again. You know, a lot of times structural analysis professors don't really talk about this in structural analysis, but I decided to lean into it a little bit because this is real life. You're gonna use these pretty regularly. And so what I wanna do today is I wanna show you where these formulas come from. And then I'm actually gonna have you derive one for a homework assignment um, so that you kind of have an appreciation for where these come from. Um, let me sh mention a couple points about these. Um, so, for example, um, you know, you can see, you know, we've got M as a function of X, we've got V as a function of X. If you take the derivative of the moment function, it will pass the derivative test and you will get the shear function. So that's something to, you know, to mess around with. Um, the, uh, another thing that's worth mentioning is these design aids are unit neutral. In other words, they do not have a specific unit system built into it. So for instance, this deflection formula, this 5WL to the fourth over 384EI, there's two ways of handling it. You either input everything in consistent units, so your beam length needs to be in inches, your distributed load needs to be in kips per inch or whatnot, or you use the same old loads we've been using throughout the semester and break out the 1728 unit conversion factor. So either one works. The only thing is you just need to be cognizant of that. The derivation does not take into account unit systems. And so when deriving these, you don't either, okay? And we'll talk about that uh, uh, later on. Um, as the problems get a little more involved, like this is one with a, a, a uniformly distributed load, but it's not across the entire beam. This is the only one that's partially distributed. So it's only across a given region. So the formulas are gonna get a little more involved 
but uh, you know, there are two software tools available to the structural engineer that are paramount. One is, you know, a structural analysis package like recess, add, whatever, and the other is Excel. The beauty, of, the beauty of Excel is that programming these into Excel, once I program them in, I change the input, and boom, everything else is figured out for me. And so that's the, the beauty of, uh, of, these, uh, of these terms. Um, and like I said, there's oodles of these uh, guides out there. For those of you who've decided to take steel design next semester, you're going to get a copy of the steel manual. These are in the steel manual too. They're formatted a little differently, but it's all the same stuff. Um, here's one for a uniformly distributed load at one end. And you can see it, you know, they get more and more uh, uh, um, uh, fancy. Here's one with a triangular load, right? So, you know, you know, we handled this problem earlier in the semester, and so some of this stuff should look, you know, a little familiar. Um, we've got a concentrated load at mid-span, and so here's all the associated formulas with that. Um, a lot of really good stuff here. Uh, and again, practical. You're going to be doing this in, in real life. Uh, let me go back to the slides. Okay, so here's the, the, going back to the one that we're looking at with, you know, with the examples on the slides, this is the cantilever beam with the uniformly distributed load. Again, the aids are neutral with respect to the unit system, so make sure that you're cognizant of that. Um, I, I don't want to present this as just some magic fix-all solution. I mean, these are really valuable aids, but you do need to be a bit careful when using them. And let me show you two instances where you kind of need to watch out, okay? One of them is just, for example, with regards to triangular loads, okay? So this is one of the aids from the steel manual, okay? So this is uh, from uh, section uh, three, it's table 3-23 out of the, uh, the steel construction manual. This is a simple beam with a triangular load, okay? And look, we've got all the reactions figured out, we've got the shears, the moments, the maximum moment, we've got the maximum deflection, all that stuff's uh, figured out. It's beautiful, just plug and chuck. But one of the things you'll notice in the aid is this term W, okay? So for instance, if I look at the reaction, the reaction here, I don't know if you can see this, let me draw my, use my pencil. So we've got two reactions, we've got that and that, okay? And so the reactions are W over three and two W over three. Okay, well, what's W? Okay, for this particular aid, the W refers to the total amount of load. Okay, so like if I'm looking at this beam, so the beam is 40 foot long and it has a load that linearly increases from zero to two and a half kips per foot. W is not two and a half kips per foot. It's the total amount of load, which in this problem would be 50 kips because it's the area under the, 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 the triangle, right? One half base times height. So when you start plugging and chugging stuff into these formulas, you got to be careful that you're using the right inputs, okay? Does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions about that? Okay, good. All right. Now, here's another thing to be careful about. And if there is something that is really going to come up next semester, it's going to be this one. Okay. So I want to show you this problem. And, and for, for the sake of discussion, I want everybody to sort of focus over here. Okay. So this is a beam that's simply supported that's experiencing a uniformly distributed load of 1.3 kips per foot, and it's experiencing a concentrated load of 17 kips, okay? Now that 17 kips is not at mid-span, okay? The beam is 40 foot long, and the, the load is 15 foot from the left support, so it's not in the middle, okay? All right, this is important, okay? Now, if I had this problem, it, me as a structural engineer, uh, if I wanted to break out the use of these analysis aids, which is more than fine, um, I need to be careful, okay? Now, there is no formula, then there, there isn't going to be an analysis aid for this case. However, there is an analysis aid 
for the two separate loads. Like there's a, a, a there's one for the uh, uh, assembly supported beam with a uniformly distributed load, and then there's a separate analysis aid for a simply supported beam with a concentrated load at any point. Okay, those are those are easy to find. Okay. And let's say I've got this problem and I want to determine M max. I want to determine the maximum bending moment because I'm a designer and I want to determine what beam am I going to select to resist these loads. Okay. So I look at the uh, simply supported beam with the uniformly distributed load and it tells me that M max is WL squared over eight. And then I look at M max for the point load and it's PAB over L. And so I say, okay, I got M max over here and I got M max over here. Let's just add them up and that's what I'm going to design for. Right? Wrong. That's not correct, okay? The problem is, is that those point loads don't occur at or those maximum, sorry, not those point loads, those maximum moment locations do not occur at the same spot, okay? The M max for the distributed load occurs at mid span. The M max for the point load occurs under the point load and those aren't at the same spot. So you can't add up the M max formulas directly because they occur at different locations. What you can do is add up the functions. You can add up M of X for distributed load and M of X for the point load and add up the functions and then plot those functions. You can use Excel or you could, you know, take the derivative of that function, set it equal to zero to solve for the point of zero shear and then plug that in for uh, to determine M max. You can do that too, but what you can't do is add up the M max terms because they occur at different spots. I can't tell you how many times in uh, in steel design or concrete design I'll have a problem like this and then you'll you'll have students just add up the M max terms. That doesn't work because they're not in the same spot, okay? So you got to be careful about that. Uh, you can add up the M of X, the functions, but you can't add up just the M max terms. Does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions about that? Okay, good. Well, I want you to have a bit of an appreciation for where these analysis aids come from and, and how these form, like, I don't want you to think that these formulas just, you know, miracle themselves, you know, onto the internet. I want you to understand how they're developed. And so we're going to take a, a basic analysis case, specifically the one we've been talking about, and I want to derive expressions for the following. I want to look at the reactions, so the vertical reaction at the support and the moment reaction at the support. I want to know the function for the shear, the maximum shear. I want to know the function for the moment, the maximum moment, and then if we have time, we'll look at the deflections uh, as well. So let me stop the share and pull up the uh, OneNote. Okay, give me one sec. Okay, so here's the problem. And so uh, I know that this is probably going to be a bit symbolic. You know, we're going to be dealing with a lot of variables and, and set of numbers. And um, maybe, uh, you know, I, I hope that you don't um, get mad at me if I say that our system parameters. are W and L, um, but uh, <laughs> but um, but that's kind of what we're dealing with on, on this problem is that we're going to be looking at this in terms of variables as opposed to um, to numbers, and there is a reason for that. I, I again, I'm not throwing out variables for the sake of just making the problem alphabet soup. The idea is to de derive formulas and expressions that we can use for any beam. And so that's why we're doing this. So again, I'm not throwing, you know, variables and system parameters out there unless there's a reason for it. Okay. So let's handle this like we would handle any structural analysis problem, right? So first off, we have this, um, uh, this beam. I've got, you know, a potential reaction here. I'll call it like the vertical reaction. There's a potential moment reaction, we'll call that the moment reaction. Um, and then uh, we have our distributed load. I'm gonna take that distributed load, I'm gonna collapse that 
into a single point load. Now, how much is that point load in variables? Like, what's the magnitude of that load? W times L, there you go, W times L. And then so that we're all paying attention, how far is that from the support? What's that distance? L over two, L over two. Okay, so if I sum forces in the Y direction, well, it's not, it's not L minus X because we haven't cut a section yet, right? It, that, that'll be, and you're bringing up a, a, a good point. We are going to cut a section here in a second, but because we haven't cut a section yet, we're actually locating that load where it is. So L minus X wouldn't be appropriate now. It'll be appropriate when we look at the section. So here's what I mean by that. So let's cut a section, you know, at some random point here. This is section one, one this dimension here is going to be x this dimension l minus x right but what we're talking about is the entire beam and the entire beam sees a load of wl and that load is l over 2 from the support does that make sense good deal all right so if i uh, some forces in the y direction, I have WL going down, so my reaction, my vertical reaction has to be WL going up. So there's a formula right there. The vertical reaction is WL, okay? What about the moments? So we'll sum moments at, here, let's uh, sum moments at the support. right? So if I sum moments at the support, all right, I'm going to have WL, all right, so let's make sure everybody's paying attention. WL, which side of the table is that going to go on, the left or the right? There we go, WL, and what's the moment arm? There we go. Okay, and so that has to be counteracted by the, the moment reaction acting in the opposite direction. So the moment reaction is WL squared over 2, because WL times L over 2, WL squared over 2, and that's acting that way, right? So if I look here at my whiteboard, I've already got a couple of the, uh, and, I'll, and I'll mark this down here in a second, but I've already got a couple of my formulas figured out. I know that the vertical reaction is WL going up, and I've got that the moment reaction is WL squared over 2, and it acts this way, right? And I'll pull the, the board up here in a second, but you can see, so there, so if I was trying to build like an, an analysis aid or an Excel, you know, type templates where I could just plug in W and plug in L and it would give me everything I need, I'm already on my way there, okay? Now let's, um, let's take this a little step further. So, so here's my problem, right? And I know that this is WL and I know that this is WL squared over two, right? So let's treat this like an analysis problem and let's start drawing shear and moment diagrams, okay? So here's the shear diagram. Let's, let's put some color on this. So here's the shear diagram. And actually, let me take the units off because there are no units here. I start off at zero and then I have a uniformly distributed load, right? And so a uniformly distributed load has a constant magnitude, so the shear is linear. The shear is linear, it's pointing down. So I go down here to minus WL, and then I have a vertical reaction, 
that pops me back up to zero. Boom. That right there, there is your uh, shear diagram, linear shear diagram expressed in terms of symbology. Okay. What about the moment diagram? How do we do the moment diagram? Well, we need to determine the area under the shear diagram. What is the area under the shear diagram? Somebody help me out. WL over two, yeah. WL squared over two. And that matters. That that really matters. The the, the exponents and stuff like that, that, that does that does have an impact on the uh, the answer at the end. So this is going to be minus WL squared over two. That's the area. No, oh, <laughs> that's fine. All right, so this is zero. Uh, and then this is a moment diagram. We have a linear shear diagram, so we have a parabolic moment diagram. Little to a lot, so little to a lot. Actually, I can do a better net. There you go. That's a little better. And that's minus WL squared over 2. And then that jumps back up to 0. And the reason it jumps back up to 0 is because we have our reactions right there, right? So another thing that we can determine from just from looking at our shear diagram is our V max is uh, we could say minus WL, but more often than not, uh, the analysis aids that you will see will not look at this in terms of signs. They'll just say V max is WL. If, if you want to put a sign there, you can, but usually you'll find that they're not there. And so if you look up M max, Usually what you'll find is just WL squared over 2. Again, a lot of times the signs are left off because the context is what matters, right? We know that this beam is going to be experiencing negative bending. We know it's going to be uh, bending in frowny face fashion. So all we need to know is the magnitude. And so again, a lot of times these analysis aids will leave the, mag uh, the, the signs off. They won't explicitly state, hey, this is, you know, that, you know, this is negative or positive. So that's just something to keep in mind. So right off the bat, we've got V max is WL, and then M max is WL squared over 2. Now, it just so happened that the maximum shear and the maximum moment equals the reactions on this problem, and that's because it's a cantilever. I'll go ahead and tell you on your homework assignment, that will not happen. On your homework assignment, it will be different, okay? On your homework assignment, you'll have, like it might, I'll go ahead and tell you, the moments won't, ma there won't be anything to match because there won't be a moment reaction. It's a simply supported problem. For the shears, maybe, but not for the moments. Now, last thing. Okay. As, uh, uh, you know, we looked at our last problem, or, or as we looked up above, let me, let me look at this down here. Um, we are going to also try and look at functions. We're going to try and look at moment uh, and shear functions. And so that means cutting a section, you know, uh, and, and uh, uh, investigating the, the internal response. So, you know, remember from when we talked about deflections, typically what we like to do is say, okay, this is our origin. This is Y. This is X. And so that's our origin. This distance is X. This distance is L minus X. When you cut a section, which direction should we look? Let's see if y'all remember, to the left or to the right? Yes, look towards the origin. Remember, whenever you're dealing with cantilevered beams, it's easier to look towards the free end. It's always easier to look towards the origin. So we're going to cut a section and look to the left. 
And so when we cut a section and we look to the left, right? So here's the section. Here's our section cut. Remember, we've got an unknown shear, an unknown moment. Those are the positive sign conventions that we that we utilize. Um, we have our distributed load W. This segment is X long. Again, just with before, we're going to take this, we're going to collapse it into a single point load. How much is that point load? WX. And how far is it from the section cut? X over two, exactly right. So if we sum forces in the Y direction, right? So we have V going down, WX going down, nothing going up. So zero equals V plus WX. So V is W or negative, sorry, negative WX. Again, you might find that some of these analysis aids don't put the sign. They don't, they don't bother with the negative because they just rely on context. You look at the shear diagram, they're all negative. So that's just something to keep in mind. If you sum moments at the cut, see, I, when I do these, I always keep the sign, but that, that's just me. We have M going this way, WX times X over two going that way. And so we have zero equals M plus W over two X squared. M over two, uh, negative W over two X squared. Does that answer make sense when we compare these two functions? In other words, if we were looking for something, like how, how do we know just by looking at those functions that, that they at least make sense? In other words, like whenever you derive a moment function and a shear function, there's always something you can do to check. The derivative of the moment is the shear. Exactly right. So if I take the derivative of the moment function, I get you know, w over 2 times the derivative of x squared. The derivative of x squared is 2x. So I got w over 2 times 2x. So the 2s cancel and I get wx. So that's always something that you can do to check to see whether or not what you're doing uh, is correct. So you're exactly right. And so there you go. I mean, think, we've already got, the sh we, we know what the reactions are, we know what the shears are, we know what the moments are, we know what the maximum shears and moments are. So for a designer, you've pretty much got everything you need. The one thing that you don't have are the deflections, and I want to show you how to do that, okay? Because um, we have time, and it's really not that hard. I'll go ahead and tell you that there is a little bit more, um, alphabet soup with determining the deflections, but it's no uh, uh, increase in difficulty. So let me show you how this works, All right? So if we look at the real structure, okay, so our real structure looks like this. Right? This is W. Here's our origin. And this is L. What we just derived was M of X is minus WX squared over 2. Here, I'll, I'll write it like this. I'll say minus w over 2x squared, and that's valid from 0 to L, right? Now, 
let's just keep things simple. Let's just find the deflection at a single point. Let's look at, say, the deflection. Like, where's the deflection on this beam going to be the largest? Somebody help me out. Where do you think the deflection is going to be the largest? Just by observation. The free end. Exactly. So here's our virtual structure. Let's just put a, a 1.0 load right there at the free end, right? So this dimension is L. And then we're going to do what we did before. We need a moment function, right? So we're going to cut a section. One uh, Section 1, we'll say that uh, this distance is X, right? And so when we look at that section, that's X, right? And so we've got an unknown shear, an unknown moment, but all I care about for deflections is the moment. I need the little m, right? So if I sum moments at the cut, I have my little m going like that. And then I have 1 times x. So I've got 1.0 times x going like that. So it's just 0 equals m plus x. or M is minus X. Everybody with me so far? So if you wanted to apply, let's say, the method of virtual work, So the method of virtual work, what will we do? If we wanted to find the deflection at uh, the free end, so deflection max, we're going to integrate little m, big m over EI from 0 to L. Because we only have one function for both. we got a little m and a big m, and they apply across the entire beam. So that's all we have to do. right? So we've got the integration from 0 to L. What do we have? We got 1 over EI. Let's factor that out. We got little m, which is minus x, and big M minus W over 2x squared. And so how I handle this, let's take all the constants, chug them out on the outside. So what's that? We got W over 2EI. 0 to L. And what's left in the middle? Well, I got an X. I got an X squared. So that's X to the third. And so now this comes a pretty doable problem, right? What's the integral of X to the third? It's X to the fourth over 4 from 0 to L, right? And remember, when you're dealing with an integral that has a lower bound of zero, I can plug in that zero, and it's gonna it's gonna be zero. So this is ultimately gonna equal w over two ei l to the fourth over four minus zero. So therefore, I have a formula for delta max w l to the fourth over 8EI. And if you go back to the slides, you'll see that's exactly what was in the in the aid. Exactly. And so it's it's not complicated, you know. And and the beauty of it is, yeah, I mean there's a little bit more alphabet soup, but now that it's derived, we'll never need to derive it again, right? 
I mean, any time that we have a cantilevered beam with a uniformly distributed load, no need to do this anymore. No need to break out method of virtual work. No need to break out moment functions and shear functions and all this stuff. It's right here. It's done. Just plug and chug. And so just to put a bow on this and close this lecture, if you stop the share, I mean, here's the money. This is what we we're after. This is our analysis aid. This is the aid for analysis for that problem. And if you go back to the slides, look what we got. Here's our reactions. Same thing we got, shear function, moment function, maximum shear, or sorry, maximum moment, but look at this, maximum deflection, WL to the fourth over ADI, same thing we got, exact same thing. We didn't do the deflection at X, it's not hard, just a little bit more alphabet soup, instead of placing the load at um, you know, the free end, just place it at any point, and then just do the integration, just not harder, just a little bit more. Any questions before I call it? All right, well, I gave you a challenge that's similar to this. It's a simply supported beam. I'm interested on your homework, like the required portion is to only do the shears and moments, but I gave you a, like a little bit of an incentive. If you get the mid-span deflection, that's an extra five points on top of the assignment. So it's like a little extra challenge if you're interested in doing it. If not, you don't have to, no big deal. Wednesday, we talk about tributary area. I think you'll get a kick out of that one. I think you'll really like it. That's all I have, everybody. I will see you all on Wednesday. Everybody stay safe, stay healthy. We'll see you then.